Well, this is session 15 of our exploration of the Gospel of Matthew. And last time we took a topic in part, we took chapter 21 in part and focused on that, enough so that we have the remainder of chapter 21 to accomplish in this session. And uh, then we'll get into chapter 22 as part of session 15. And so to give you a, just a, a little background for those that may be joining us uh, midstream here, uh, the outline for the, what we call Unit 1, the first 12 chapters, uh, the first section of that, of course, has the genealogy of Christ, the birth of Christ, the baptism of Christ, the temptation of Christ, and the manifesto of Christ, as in the opening chapters. Uh, Matthew being Jewish, it's a very uh, focused approach to presenting Jesus Christ as the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King. And uh, the second section of the first half of the thing is, com- there was a whole series of, of miracles, 12 sent out, and uh, We addressed a number of questions, the Sabbath issues, the unpardonable sin. But when you get to chapter 12, that closes the unit, what we call unit one, the first half, in a sense, of the uh, Gospel of Matthew. And uh, so uh, chapter 12 is where they, uh, that's really in effect where many scholars feel the rejection of the nation, by the nation of the Messiah took place as they ascribe his, his miracles to Beelzebub. And we note that at that chapter, Jesus' uh, approach changes completely because he never speaks to the public except in parables. He explains the parables only in private. And if you haven't studied chapter 13 to pick up that change, it's very important you really understand why did Jesus talk in parables. It's, a, it's actually quite a surprise. But we are then uh, having uh, closed the first unit, the second unit... Uh, with 13, we have the seven kingdom parables, a number of feedings, 5,000, 4,000, climaxing in many respects in the, set, in the transfiguration in chapter 17. And then we had some other teachings about uh, due process and torts. We, along the way, we talked a lot about Herods. There's a number of them, but the key four that we should know as Bible uh, uh, students is Herod the Great, of course, who slew the children in Bethlehem. His son was uh, the one that killed John the Baptist, and that's the one before whom Jesus is silent in Luke 23. His son, the, the, the grandson of Herod the Great, was Herod Agrippa, that uh, uh, kills James and imprisons Peter and is active in the, in the book of Acts. And then his son, Herod Agrippa II, is the one before whom Paul is tried and so forth. So these four, don't confuse them, uh, Antipas, Agrippa, and Agrippa II. So... But in any case, uh, and feeding the multitudes, familiar parables, but we invite you to notice that they are distinctive, and they carry a symbolic message that's quite distinct also. The 5,000 being predominantly Jews, taking place in Galilee, and uh, 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 has a number of distinctives. And the 4,000, which occurs in the next chapter of Matthew, predominantly Gentiles in Gentile uh, uh, area. And it has some symbolic implications that are distinct. So I'll leave that for you to refresh. But uh, in unit two, of course, is the Judean ministry. That's where we're in now the, uh, in the final week. And we took uh, Matthew 19 to 21 before. We took the triumphal entry last, in the last session, which is recorded in all four Gospels, which is a clue that that's very, very important and uh, very critical. And the final week is what we're really starting to focus on. It start, in Matthew, it starts with chapter 21 and Luke at 19. But I encourage you to read both sessions in parallel as we go into this climactic part of the Gospel of Matthew. The triumphal entry being chapter 21 of Matthew and 19 of Luke, and we went into some depth on that last time. And uh, as we move through uh, Matthew 22 and 23 of various teachings, Matthew 24 is in parallel to Luke 21, It's often called the Olivet Discourse, and that's a strange label. Um, It's just a way of distinguishing this particular discourse, but uh, uh, that's what's coming up, and we want to be prepared to really, it's one of the most important prophetic passages in the New Testament. And then, of course, we get into the final week with the, the Last Supper or the Last Seder, more properly called, in Matthew 26, and uh, then the crucifixion, of course, and the resurrection, which completes the gospel. 
And uh, Matthew 26, 27, 28 parallels Luke 22, 23, and 24. Encourage you to read, have your reading in parallel with that too as we go forward. But the 69 weeks last time we talked about very strange prophecy given to Daniel by Gabriel in which he gives Daniel four verses and Jesus himself points to those four verses as the key to end time prophecy. We'll find that happening in one of the subsequent sessions. But we want to highlight this. It's the most uh, astonishing passage in the, in the Bible in my opinion. Gabriel tells Daniel to know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid will be seven plus three score two. That is seven plus 62, which is 69 altogether. 69 weeks of years. And the street shall be built again and the wall, even troubled times. Given to Daniel while he was still a slave in Babylon, but sensitive to the fact that it was about over. And that the angel tells him, from this, the commandment to restore to build Jerusalem, the city, unto the Messiah, the king, will be a specific period of time. From one event unto the other is a very precise period of time. And as we examine that, the commandment to board, what in effect Gabriel is telling Daniel is that it's 69 weeks of years, and that would be... Um, uh, 483 years, but if we know that about the 360-day issue, it's actually you can take a number of days, 173,880 days. And we know the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes Longimanus in March 14th to 445. The real question is, what, when did the Messiah present himself as a king? And that, of course, is when Jesus deliberately arranges to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh thee. Very key part of this prophecy. Uh, not just that he's riding a donkey, but he's presenting himself as a king to Jerusalem. And that, of course, takes place. And, and uh, they, as they, uh, they sing, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord on what we call the triumphal entry. And uh, the Pharisees, of course, are upset when we run the risk of missing a point. The Pharisees always highlight it by getting upset and tells we, us as Gentiles, that we should uh, um, pay attention and figure out why they're upset. And, they, and of course, they think they're, they're recognizing that he, they're, the crowd is declaring him the Messiah. And Jesus said, I, I, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Very interesting use of phrase. In any case, it turns out as we examine all of this, recognizing that all of what I've shown you here in Daniel was in black and white in the Septuagint three centuries before the New Testament period. And yet, as we go through and recognize the realities here, from that decree until the triumphal entry, turns out to be precisely 173,880 days. Gabriel's margin for error was zero. I never use the word approximate in God in the same sentence. And this most astonishing uh, prediction, a precise demonstration that Jesus Christ is exactly uh, who he is. Uh, the, the, the appointed Messiah. And of course, he weeps over the city. And many people miss this point. He says, if, he says, He wept over Jerusalem. If thou, and this happens to be preparation for some of the things that are coming. That's why I'm doing this as a review. Um, as he became near Jerusalem, he said, he, and he wept over it. And he's saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace. In other words, this is a very specific day appointed by God. But now they are hid from thine eyes. Because they didn't recognize that day, they're blinded. And uh, they're blinded as Paul, uh, this, because of their failure to recognize this. But now they're hid from thine eyes. But then he goes on to mention something else. He says, For the day shall come upon thee, thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. And it's fascinating, 38 years later, the Roman legions literally laid siege and uh, leveled the place, ultimately. And uh, a million and a half children slaughtered, uh, a million and a half men, women, and children slaughtered uh, in Jerusalem uh, at the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And why did Jerusalem fall in 70 AD? It's a great question on a final exam. There are a lot of candidate answers why there's a major negative, cloudy, black um, milestone in Jewish history. Why did Jerusalem fall? Jesus' answer was because they knew not the time of their visitation. He held them accountable to know Daniel 9. Astonishing passage, especially from that point of view. 
uh, it was not the time. So anyway, that, that is where we were last time. We're going to continue chapter 21 in our progress here. And after that event and riding the donkey in, Jesus then cleanses the temple, which is the next major thing. Matthew 20, 20, excuse me, 21, verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. You know, he opened his ministry with a similar act back in John chapter 2. And uh, now three years later, uh, the temple was defiled again by the same religious business, if I can call it that, of the leaders. Annas, the former high priest, and his sons helping him, apparently were behind this racket, according to the historians. And uh, so, see, you, uh, to comply with the regulation of the temple, you had to have temple coin. And so you had to have convert your regular commercial currency into the coin of the temple. And that, of course, created an opportunity for money changers, which on the one hand is a valid service in one sense, but obviously two things were wrong. They're apparently being abusive, and secondly, it had no business being in the temple. And so uh, it was, uh, Jesus went ahead and dealt, <laughs> dealt with that. And uh, the den of thieves comes from a, Jer a Jeremiah passage of the same subject, by the way, from the Old Testament. Uh, continuing then, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the word wonderful may be an editorial term. They were awed, uh, uh, wonderful in the classic sense, or awesome uh, things that he did. Uh, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased and said to them, Hearest thou what these say? They're really upset because they're recognizing him as messianically again. Jesus said to them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. He happens to be quoting Psalm 8, verse 2. But the main point is, is the, 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 the chief priests and scribes are upset because even the children are recognizing the uniqueness of Christ in the situation. And so Jesus left them and went out of the city into Bethany and lodged there. Now, Bethany is about a Sabbath day's journey from the temple. That's one reason you find him so often in Bethany. He had friends there, of course, Lazarus and Mary and all that. And, uh, but it was a, it was a, a legal walk. Uh, that was close enough to be a legal walk on Shabbat. And so that's where he lodged. Then we have this other strange event that occurred. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Strange event. Strange event. And uh, you sometimes see it rendered in movies and stuff uh, enigmatically. I mean, it's quite clear that often even the people who produce the movie didn't really understand what that had to do with anything. Well, was he against figs? I don't think so. Quite the contrary. He wanted some that weren't there. Uh, in most varieties, of fig trees in that part of the country, the leaves show up. Um, uh, the figs should, excuse me, the figs should show up before the leaves. So when you see leaves, you would expect the figs to be already there. That's what is not obvious unless you, without that little bit, bit of background. And so, uh, but Jesus is actually making a point here. Um, in Several other places, not in Matthew account particularly, but both in Luke and Matthew 21, earlier, you find the term Bethphage for that area. Bethphage and Bethany are, in a sense, almost like synonyms. Bethphage means the house of unripe figs, strangely enough. And uh, the fig tree symbolizes, now many, most scholars would recognize this as symbolizing the nation of Israel. They would draw upon Jeremiah 8, Hosea 9 and Luke 13 uh, for references there. There are some scholars that say it's actually more specifically the house of Judah. And uh, so it's, whether it's the nation as a whole or focusing on Judah is a, a debate that you uh, involves some other issues that are very tangential to our purpose here. But uh, the, the um, specificity of Judah is suggested from Isaiah 24 uh, uh, 
uh, also Hosea 9 and Joel 1, for those of you that want to get into that. But the main idea here is just as the tree had leaves but no fruit, so Israel had a show of religion, but no practical experience of faith resulting in godly living. That's the net of this. Not just this, but a number of things that are going to follow in this and the subsequent chapter. You're going to discover that these things all fit into a pattern. They're not just little random parables that will surface here shortly. The main point that comes out of all of this, and we could spend a lot of time uh, hammering this, but I think it's pretty self-evident to the serious student. The main theme here is God wants to produce fruit in the lives of his people. The focus here, of course, is Israel. Their failure to be prepared for and receive their Messiah. We're going to talk heavily about that in the next couple of sessions. So that has a, a specific geopolitical application to the time that we're dealing with. It also clearly doesn't take any imagination to recognize how it applies to us personally. That's exactly, God expects our lives to bear fruit. Often with a large audience, I'll ask the audience, how many of you are saved? How many of you are saved? Can I see? Show of hands. My second question is, what have you done with it? You know, there's a tendency in the evangelical community to celebrate when someone makes a decision for Christ. They come down the sawdust trail and they answer an altar call and they make a decision for Christ and we, we celebrate that. I'm not demeaning that, but there is a misleading aspect of that. That's not a climax, it's a beginning. The real issue isn't making that, deci that decision. The real issue is how are you going to finish? The landscape's littered with people for whom finishing well was not part of their epitaph. And uh, so God expects a real conversion to bear fruit. And uh, uh, we, we can't, we're not here to judge gifts. See, I'm not interested in whether you're speaking in tongues or this or that, what your gift might be. I am, but not, not as, a, as an endpoint. We're not gift inspectors, we're fruit inspectors. Are there, is there fruit in your life is the real issue. And uh, that's another aspect of this. Well, let's move on. In Matthew 20, verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, that is this dried up fig tree, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. That's quite a challenge. That's quite a challenge. Easily abused, but quite a challenge. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? They're upset. He just cleaned house. He had a major impact on their profit plan. So they're challenging his authority to do all of this. Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which, if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. He knew that they were um, you know, just trying to trap him. There's a whole series of these attempts at entrapment that he's de dealing with, and this is anticipatory in that sense. And, uh, you know, in verse 23, they, you know, by what authority? Our response to that is, this is late in the game, fella. They had their chance and they blew it back in chapter 12 and following, right? And uh, so he's going to give them the answer to their question when he's under oath before the high priest in, a couple of, about, in about three or four days from now. But he's not going to play their game here. You want to know what my authority is? If you, you, you answer my question, I'll answer yours. The baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or men? The baptism of John. Whence was it? In other words, he's in effect asking him, you know, by, by what authority did they kill John? From heaven or of men? Now you can sort of see them back off and murmur among themselves, reasoning how they're going to answer this question. They reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, and why did ye not then believe him? But if we say of men, we fear the people. For all whole, John is a prophet. So they got, he's got them over a barrel. He's got them right where they were trying to get him. 
You know, I lo- it, it would be interesting. I have never actually done this. I probably should. be interesting just to take these exchanges between Christ and his adversaries. How he always, and this is not a surprise if you understand who he is, <laughs> he always outmaneuvers them. I think it's, it's, it's masterful. It's, it's fun. Um, but um, so on the one hand, the, he's courting them because they didn't believe him. If he's from heaven, they got a real problem. If he wasn't from heaven, then he's, he's, he, he, they got a crowd around him. The, 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 the crowd thinks uh, John the Baptist was great news. And so <laughs> their answer to him was, the answer Jesus said, we cannot tell. He said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you can't. You can't escape, despite the tensions involved, you can't escape the sense of humor in the situation. You know, the irony, how he's got them trapped and he's got them right to where they were trying to get him, if you follow me. And this goes on with the Caesar's coin and all that rest coming up here. But, but uh, it's, it's fun to see the give and take. Nothing here compares with John 8 where they call him a bastard, and he says, I'll tell you about your parentage, and so forth. You know, John 8, you, when you read John 8, you really need to not miss the vituperative tension between the, uh, them there. Not that this isn't tense here, too. But Jesus goes on, what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and he went. He came to the second son and said, likewise. He answered, I go, sir, and went not. You see the two contrasts here, right? Whether of them twain did the will of his father. He's asking them here. This is a teaching going on here. They sent him the first. Jesus said, and verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Because, see, he's addressing the Pharisees. And they, they go through all the motions, but they're, he's looking inside where their hearts are. They're losers. There are others that are disparaged in the society that, in fact, have more access to the kingdom of God than they have because they've got a chance of sincerely repenting and coming to faith. It's interesting that, uh, that uh, well, let's go on. For John came in unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believe him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So the point is that, you see, John had fruit. Now, he's going to subsequently get into a vineyard parable. But I thought it would be useful before we get to the next teaching of Christ, which is about a vineyard model. We should take a look at where he's drawing the idioms from, and that's the book of Isaiah chapter 5. He's actually, it, it, the, the first seven verses of Isaiah 5 is a needful background to really grasp what Jesus is about to get into in his next parable. But I thought it would be useful to rather than just summarize that, is to, let's go and take a look at what Isaiah actually wrote in the first seven verses of Isaiah 5. I've got a double reason for wanting to do this. I'll explain in a minute. Isaiah says in verse 1 of chapter 5, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. It's kind of interesting as we're going on here, his beloved here in effect is the Messiah. Jesus is going to draw, in effect, on this background. But I love that he's calling here the idiom that Isaiah... Isaiah, by the way, is one of the most articulate of all the prophets. Amos and some of the other prophets came from the hill country. Not, you know, they were men, of the, men of, of, of the earth. Isaiah was of royalty. He had one of the most eloquent vocabularies in the entire Old Testament. And he... he, he uh, uh, execute his office before kings. And you, uh, but it's interesting to see him speak of what in effect is God as the well-beloved one. I think that's, that's beautiful. Anyway, my be- well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill on good ground. Okay. He fenced it. 
He gathered out the stones thereof, planted it with a choice of vine, built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. These are not commercially useful. This is, a, this is like analogous to weeds in a sense. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, Isaiah's being quite clear, he's interpreting it for us here. O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? And now go, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And I'll break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. The owner of this vineyard really is upset. Because he's done everything you could imagine to have it be fruitful. And it's a loser. And he's angry. So he's casting it away in effect. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression. For righteousness, but behold a cry. Now that's the background we need for the coming verses in Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew's gospel. But I find it irresistible since I went that far. I wanted to add a few other verses, and I'll tell you why. You got, I think the, the application is pretty obvious. The vineyard represents Israel and its lack of fruitfulness, and because of its lack of fruitfulness, it's going to incur God's judgment. And that's what Jesus is going to amplify when we get back to Matthew. But as I travel, people ask me, where's the United States in prophecy? Now, there's a number of characters that have published books saying that, I, you know, that, that uh, America is here or there, and they have their various conjectures, which I don't happen to share, so I won't even bother presenting them, certainly not defend them. People ask me, where is it? When I, they ask me that, I say, America is clearly in prophecy. It's in Isaiah chapter 5. Really? Yeah. It's not the only place, it's usually Hosea 4 through 14 also, but let's, let's, let's take a look at what Isaiah is talking. He, his context, of course, is Israel, but let's watch what he says when we go further. You have the famous six woes follow. Isaiah says, woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. That's... What it's really saying, it's a form of materialism. They build house after house and add land and it's prosperity. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one both, and a seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, until wine inflame them. Alcoholism. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and the wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. He's not through. He's going to go on with some more woes here. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat one shall strangers eat. So Isaiah is elaborating on the judgment that's coming upon Israel because they've forsaken, they've forsaken God. He's not through. Woe unto them, get this one, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity 
and sin, as it were, with a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. That's a taunt. That's being said sarcastically. Notice verse 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. In other words, they are parading their disregard of God in a parade. They're drawing it. When you see in the press what they call the gay pride parades, that's what I see in this verse. One of them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, they're actually hauling this in a parade. And sin, as it were, with a cart rope? Boy, that's graphic. How interesting it is that the Katrina disaster happened on the weekend of the largest gay pride celebration on the planet Earth annually. How interesting. And even the taunt here that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw an eye and come that we may know it. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Call that value relativism if you like. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The interesting inversion of values in our culture. You take a guy like Mel Gibson who does a movie on the deity of Christ and the critics ex- figure it was a, you know, a money-making snub f- film. You've got to be kidding. You have Dan Brown who published a fiction novel libeling Jesus Christ and it's considered great history, believe it or not. Astonishing to read the reviews in contrast. What's going on here? Fiction extolled for truth, and truth, even the deity of Christ, dismissed as fiction. Going on, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. When I see that, I think of the Jesus seminar where scholars, so called, exchange their subjective guesses for sound scholarship. They vote on what they think Jesus probably said. And maybe if he had enough votes, he'd resign or something. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to make strong drink, that justify the wicked for reward. These are judges that take bribes and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the holy word of the Holy One of Israel. This, of course, is addressed, this is judgment coming upon Israel. But I personally cannot escape the parallelism between their predicament and their being overdue for judgment with our predicament and our heritage. There's probably no nation I can think of on the planet Earth that more deserves God's judgment because of our heritage. Other countries have not had the benefit, the heritage that we had. And we've disparaged it and failed to protect it. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. Boy, that's graphic word, isn't it? For all this, his anger was not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from afar, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. Well, okay. So much for a little background from Hosea, excuse me, from Isaiah 5. Let's now see, go, return what Jesus is teaching here, the people. Hear another parable, Jesus, Matthew 21, verse 33. Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Do you see the parallel with those Isaiah 5? Some nuances are changing here. Now, this guy has given it to to stewards here. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. In other words, every time he sends his representatives to get 
the pay that's due him, they get slaughtered. What do you think this guy's thinking? He, you know, he, he, the, the owner's getting probably pretty cool here on the whole deal. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, well, they will reverence my son. But when the husband saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. That may sound obscure to us because we're not familiar with the laws, but there is a structure by which they could have aspired to gaining the property by killing the son. I don't want to get in those mechanics. It doesn't suit our purpose here, but you get the idea. In any case, let's seize on, let's seize on his inheritance. They caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. They even killed the owner's son. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they said unto him, his listeners, they said unto him, well, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Right. They're going to lose their franchise. Israel's going to lose their franchise. Do you say unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. Graphic language. Stones and mountains. Just a, God is referred to as a rock or a stone throughout the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 18, and so forth. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul even says that rock that followed him in the wilderness wandering was Christ. He's speaking idiomatically, of course. The stone is also a messianic title, and that's, of course, what uh, happens in a number of places. And 1 Corinthians 10, 4 is one of them. Now, uh, to Israel, Jesus was a stumbling stone, and in some respects still is today. Isaiah 8, Romans 9, 1 Corinthians 1, and so forth. Israel rejected the Messiah, but in his death and resurrection, he created the church. That's the other nation expression, if I can put it that way. To the church, Jesus is the foundation stone, the head of the corner, so, so designated in Ephesians 2, 1 Peter 2, and a number of other places. At the end of the age, that stone is going to become a mountain. Remember the, the, uh, the trailing part of the uh, Daniel 2, the famous... Nebuchadnezzar dream with the metal image. The stone cut without hands, smites it, crumbles it, and it, the stone grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth. The mountain is a, is a government. At the end of the age, Jesus will come as the smiting stone, destroying Gentile kingdoms and establish his own glorious kingdom. And that's really the climactic thing in Daniel 2. That's also portrayed with different idioms, but same issue in Daniel 7. And it's amplified, of course, in the book of Revelation 13 to, the, to 20, in effect. <laughs> I love verse 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. <laughs> in which we say, no kidding, Dick Tracy. <laughs> But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. You need to understand that his popularity, th this, is the, this is Passover week. There's probably anywhere from one to two million people in Jerusalem, which for that period is an enormous crowd. Every able-bodied Jew was to go to Jerusalem on three of the seven uh, feasts of Israel. On Passover, and that term is used for the collection of three feasts, the Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, collectively speak, spoken of connotatively as Passover, all occurring in the first uh, uh, month of the religious year. They also came, were supposed to be there in the seventh month on the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's a strange feast in between those, right in the middle of the year, so to speak, uh, the Feast of uh, Shavuot, or Pentecost. So the place is really crowded because every, every, every able-bodied Jew able to come would be there. 
And they'd all heard the stories. They heard about Lazarus and all this. And they, he was too popular for the chief priests to dare mess around here. And there's another thing that will come up in another passage in Matthew. They also plotted to kill him, but not on a feast day because of Rome. They won't take him here because of the popularity of the crowd. They don't want to have a, do it on a, on a feast period anyway because if they don't want to inter- it, Rome will not tolerate an insurrection. Rome almost didn't care what you did as long as you did it orderly. They, the way their report, the, the, the report card of the leader, Pilate, in Rome would be punched in terms of, is it orderly? If he has an insurrection, his job is at, at risk. So they did not plan to do it on a feast day. Why did it happen on a feast day? Because Jesus forced them to. He forces their hand. We'll see that when we get to the Last Supper. Many people miss that. Okay, so now we're in chapter 22. And Jesus answered and spake to them again in parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. This is a king with a wedding situation and people chose not to come. That's, that sounds hard to imagine. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, to tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. They went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. The remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. And not only didn't come to the party, they killed his representatives. Again, it's an echo of the same kind of thing. But I think you're, you're, you're picking up on the eschatological issues here, right? In this case, we're talking about a, a wedding ceremony. There's bridegroom involved. When the king heard thereof, he didn't mind at all. No, that's not what it says. I just want to see if you're paying attention. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies. Whew. This is a king. This isn't just some upset merchant. This is a king. He sent forth his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out in the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. They went out and got Republicans and Democrats and got them all in here. (laughs) Whatever. Now that's part A. You get the picture so far. There's another little lesson tucked in here in in the PS, if you will. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. See, you need to understand a custom that you and I are not familiar with probably. In those days, it was the tradition, especially of a king, that when he threw a a, a party like this, he would provide the garments so that those that were in lower station wouldn't be embarrassed. The idea was that the the part of the host, when you got there, you got the garment given to you by the, you know, you you had a proper garment for the occasion. It was provided by the host. That's not, you know, we don't have a parallel situation too much in our culture, but it's essential to understand that, to understand what's going on here. Because king goes and he finds a guy that does not have a wedding garment on. He said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. In the Greek, that means he didn't have an answer. (laughs) I'm being facetious, okay. Then said the king to to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called, but few are chosen. Wow. That's pretty spooky. I don't think you want to find yourself at the marriage supper of the Lamb without a garment provided by the bridegroom. It's not your righteousness that will carry it. You need his righteousness. That's what's... To cut right through it. Many are called, but a few are chosen. You see, it's interesting how the parable takes that twist. It's sort of a in parable. You sort of you sort of 
puncture the, 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 the model by throwing him in the outer darkness. You know, the king is going to, you, know, you follow me? There's a, you, you, he sort of shifts from the idiom to reality here. Boy. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel on how they might entangle him in his talk. You know, these guys don't have, no learning takes place. They're still at it. They're going to trick God. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel on how they might entangle him in his thought. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians. We'll talk about them in a minute. Saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Aren't they oily? Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us wherefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Well, let's back up a minute and understand what we're dealing with here. First of all, the Pharisees were pretty familiar with at this point, but who are these Herodians? That requires a little comment. They were pro-Roman Jews. Among the Jewish population, there were Jews that uh, aspired to get along with and be supportive of the, the rulers in B, B, which of course is Herod, who's an Idumean, but the point is he's really the representative of Rome. And so this group were basically uh, 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 a pro-Roman group. They had nothing in common with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are obviously very anti-Roman, and, uh, and, but what does unite them here, it, nothing unites two enemies like having a common enemy. So they're, they're, these are strange bedfellows, if you, you will, here. And uh, so they're joining to, to trip up, hopefully, that's in their mind. And so the um, Pharisees opposed the Roman poll tax. We're, talking, we're going to talk about tax here in a minute for about three reasons. They opposed the Roman poll tax because they did not want to submit to any Gentile power. On top of that, Caesar was being revered as a god, and that, of course, offended the Jewish sensibilities. And uh, furthermore, they had, they had better uses for their money than to have it absconded by Rome, just the pragmatics of it. Now, the Herodians were a party supporting Herod, and they were in favor of the tax. The Pharisees opposed the tax, the Herodians favored the tax, so they had opposite views on this issue. And... Uh, because see, Herod's authority, even though he's an uh, Idumean, an Edomite, uh, he, he's, he uh, uh, was supported by Rome, and Herod would have had a very difficult time staying in office but for Rome. So you've got to recognize he really represented the, the, Roman, authority, the Roman authority here. Now, the tax, uh, every tax that poor people had to pay was just another reminder that they were not free. It wasn't just the economics of it, it was the insult of it. That's what I'm trying to get across here. And uh, in fact, there was even a group called the Zealots. They were like an underground movement um, of fanatical Jews that often staged protests. And uh, uh, so they would, of course, oppose any Roman tax. So you've got these different groups that are all out there, and they're trying to confront Christ with a choice, do you give to Rome or not? Because if he says yes, he's going to upset all those that are um, anti-Roman. If he says no, he's got real problems with the authorities. See, it's a catch-22 kind of thing. So it's easy to see why the Pharisees and the Herodians chose the poll tax to be this litmus test here. Because if Jesus opposed the tax, he'd be in trouble with Rome. But if he approved the tax, he'd be in trouble with the population from several different points of view. Are you with me? So how is he going to deal with this? It's a real spot. And the only reason it seems so true is because we all looked ahead and seen the answer. But uh, Jesus perceived their wickedness. He wasn't conned by this greasy front end, said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. He's going to make several points here that many people miss, so let's watch this carefully. They brought unto him a denarius, we call it a penny. And he said unto them, whose is this image and superscription? And then, well, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. And unto God, the things that are God. Now, most of us recognize the story. It was a very neat way to get out from under the crossfire, to duck their, you know, to, to escape the little trap they'd set for him. No, there's something more going on here. You and I have dual citizenship. This has a direct impact for all of us. 
We know that Christians must honor and obey their rulers. Romans 13 is full of that. 1 Peter 2, 1 Timothy 2. Clearly, the New Testament teaches us to be peaceable, okay? To, to sub submit ourselves to the authorities that are uh, on us. So we have a dual citizenship. We have citizenship in heaven as well as earth. Now, in addition to obeying our rulers, we also must honor and obey God. See, therein lies the rub, by the way. You know, I grew up, uh, I, I vividly remember the 50s and 60s, where in Boy, whether it was Boy Scouts or the military, it was God and country. It was a noble thing to dedicate your life to the defense of this country. Um, you could argue that being a soldier under those conditions is the noblest profession on the earth. No greater love has any man than he lays down his life for his friends. Someone that's willing to take a uniform and defend his country is a noble endeavor. The great tragedy of recent decades, and I'm not talking about just this administration, is that we've been put on a collision course with God. Back in the 50s and 60s, you didn't have to choose between God and country. You could, with good conscience, close ranks on that issue. Today, boy, it's a tough call after the court-martial of Michael Liu, the young airman that said he would do anything a supervisor asked, but he's going to do it in an American uniform because that's the oath of office he took. And they insisted he wear a UN uniform, and he refused, and he was court-martialed. Boy, is that a watershed decision that Congress didn't rise up to the occasion to, to repair. And does that have profound implications on anyone that's serious about a military career? The other thing is, see, we're supposed to obey God. Caesar was not God. That, of course, is part of the issue here. Man bears what image? The coin bared Caesar's image. Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And unto God, the things that are God. Whose image are we made in? See the other point that's going on here? Caesar's image was on the coin. God's image is on man. And that's Mr. and Mrs. Man, of course. Genesis 1. Sin has marred that image, but through Jesus Christ it can be restored. And that's what Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, you can do your homework. Verse 22, when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. The same day came to him Sadducees. This is a different group. These are the liberals. They're also the ones that are politically more powerful in the book of Acts. Pharisees are powerful during the gospel period, but as time went on, the Sadducees really became the powerful in the Sanhedrin. So in the book of Acts, the Sadducees are really the, pol the politicos, if you will. In any case, the same day came to him uh, Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, and that phrase is put in so you understand the issues here. The, see, the Sadducees claim to abide by the Torah and attempts by the Pharisees to prove the supernatural from the Torah it turns out to be problematical, strangely enough. So they could, the Sadducees successfully maintain that they, uh, they followed the Torah, but they didn't believe in the supernatural resurrection, that sort of thing. So they ask him, say, Master... Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. And there he's, they're quoting Deuteronomy 25 and 5 and following, which is called the, the uh, Leverite marriage. The word Leverite really means, uh, uh, comes from the Latin word levir, which means a husband's brother. It's not, it's not Levitical, it's a different word, L-E-V-I-R. It, uh, it uh, means, in effect, a husband's brother. And so, um, it's got nothing to do with the tribe of Levi or anything like that. But anyway, Leverite marriage... If, uh, if a man die having no children, his brother didn't have to, but he had the opportunity, if he chose to, to marry his dead brother's wife and raise up seed to the family. And uh, now they set this up, speaking from the Torah, as a, as a Sadducee might, but then they, they, they dream up this, this, this uh, hypothetical situation. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and then the third unto the seventh. In other words, these brothers seem to have a real uh, mortality problem <laughs> because they keep dying off. At this point, you'd think you'd want to check the, what's she feeding these guys or whatever, but in any case. And last of all, the women, woman died also. 
Therefore, in the, the, the question they're setting up here is the next one, is verse 28. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. They're trying, what this is their clumsy way to attack this whole issue of the resurrection. In their minds, this sort of is a demonstration that the, re, the whole concept of resurrection is foolishness because they can't see how this would work. That's their, that's their, their point. Jesus answered to them, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Boy, that's a sentence, man. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In heaven, people don't die, therefore there's no need for procreation. Procreation is an appropriate to a species that needs to perpetuate itself because of death. In the resurrection, they, that is the departed saints, presumably here, neither marry nor are given marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. This does not say that the angels are sexless. It says that they don't procreate. The angels in heaven don't marry. That's what it says. Many people misunderstand this because they see this as some kind of implication on Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, the angels are not in heaven. They're mischievous falling angels. I wouldn't deny technology to any mischievous angel, whatever the technology they used. And uh, these are angels in heaven. These are the good guys. It is interesting that angels are always depicted, when they do materialize, as masculine. In fact, very dramatically so in Genesis 19, where the homosexuals of the city went after them. I don't need to draw you pictures. Verse 31. But Jesus continues, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read which was spoken unto you by God, saying... Jesus is making another statement. Again, you may miss unless you read it carefully. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying... I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The point here, by the way, isn't that God is alive, is that they still are. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. They're not dead. They're there with him. That's what they really he's pointing to here. Have you not read that which was spoken of to you by God? I love that because that authenticates the Old Testament too. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. They understood what he was saying. When the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. <laughs> He can't be all bad, right? <laughs> then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? He said to him, and what he quotes here, by the way, is this, what's known as the Shema. It's quoted from, Daniel, from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and so on. The hero Israel in the Hebrew is Shema, here. So they call that passage the Shema. If you go virtually on any Jewish household or office or building, you will see on the, the doorpost a little decorative, they call it a masusa, it's a little container, inside of which is typically the Shema. Technically, it could be some other things too, but usually, I would say 99 out of 100 would be the Shema in there. Uh, in parchment, was rolled up and put inside this little container, and they kiss it on the way through, and that's the Shema, because they venerate that as the, the ultimate. They, they venerate that the way, I guess, Christians venerate John 3.16. They might not know anything else in the Scripture, but they know the Shema. Many Christians know no other verse, but, you know, for God so loved the world, they gave it and so forth. Okay. So anyway, so Jesus is quoting here is the greatest commandment from the Son of God himself. God said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's essentially the Shema with one subtle change that we don't have to get into here, but be aware of the fact that he added one small little thing. What does he mean by mind? It's not your brain. That's a whole other study. What do we mean by heart? 
What do I mean by soul? Heart, soul, spirit, mind. These are terms we use. What do they really mean? You don't go to a dictionary, because that depends on context. What you want to do is take those words in the Greek and the Hebrew and examine every place in the Bible they appear and discover what they really mean. My wife spent 20 years doing that, and that led to her trilogy of books called The Way of Agape. But the real discovery in that, in my mind, was the realization of what those words actually mean, and they're not what you think they mean. We think of mind, we think it equivalent to brain. That's not what the word means. Okay? And uh, we go into you know, heart and soul, those are loosely used words and misused in, in the colloquial environment. They're used very precisely in the architecture of the temple, and you want to understand that. Anyway, this is the first and great commandment. No, no argument there. Jesus goes on to give them the second in, li in line here. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love the, thy neighbor as thyself. He's basically quoting Leviticus 19.18. And even an unbelieving Jew would agree that Jesus adequately summarized the entire Bible by quoting two verses. The Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4 and the what we would call the golden rule kind of thing. That's It really isn't, but anyway, Leviticus 19.18. And it's interesting that the Islamic Quran has not one commandment in it, cover to cover, to love anything, but has over a hundred commands to execute the non-believers, the non-believers in Islam. If you just be aware of the, the disinformation that's being promoted throughout our culture. But anyway, Jesus gives, quotes these two, and then he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Go through the Ten Commandments. The first three are our love of God, and the rest are our love of our brother. But they all dovetail together, obviously. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, oh, I love this. Now his turn to ask them a question. Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Meaning the Messiah. Whose son is the Messiah? Well, they said unto him, the son of David. Okay, good. That's, the, that's known as the setup. Okay, okay. You know, in boxing, it's the jab just before the right cross coming in here. He said, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David call him Lord, how is he then his son? Man, that's a stumper. The Messiah is the son of David, and David calls him Lord. You see, you can't, what this is highlighting is the God-man issue. And you say, well, you know, nowhere does the Messiah is supposed to be, you know, some, they, have, they have very strange arguments. This nails it. But here's the fun part. No man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> Party's over, guys. You had your chance. Okay. For the next session... You are to read not only Matthew 23, but I want you to go ahead and review Matthew 5. Back when we started the study of Matthew, we went through the Manifesto of the King, the Sermon on the Mount, which is three chapters, 5, 6, and 7. Just review your notes after read Matthew 23, read Matthew 5 for some structural issues.